Hi, welcome to the first module covering lecture six on extrema of functions. Now, in the past three lectures, we've talked about various aspects of calculus, and consistently throughout, we've mentioned that one of the big payoffs of doing calculus is the ability to optimize a function. We've given several reasons for this. In doing game theory, game theory centers on trying to find the optimal response to someone else's action. Expected utility theory centers on trying to find the action that yields you the, the largest expected utility. All these require you to find the largest um, utility, which involves maximizing your utility function. Maximizing is one aspect of optimization. It's finding the best action for you to give you the optimum outcome. To do that, we have to find the maximum of a function. Sometimes we don't need to find maximum, though we might want to minimize loss. Say we have some act multiple actions, each of which occasions some loss for us. Um, you know, the lesser of the two evils type of scenario, in which case we want to minimize loss. Minimizing a function also is a matter of finding the extremum of a function, the points at which, in this case, the loss is lowest. So in game theory, it's just filled... Um, populated with optimization problems, which you mostly maximize and occasionally minimize functions. For statistics, it's also the case. If you're trying to do ordinary least squares, or OLS, um, what you're trying to do is minimize the least squared error. It's again a problem of finding an extremum of the function. In this case, the function is the least squared error. If you're doing maximum likelihood, it's in the name, maximum. You're trying to maximize a likelihood function. So as you see, maximizing and minimizing functions is central to both game theory and statistics. It forms the backbone of both, um, both topics. So it's really important to understand how to do it and to be able to do it yourself. Fine. And so in the previous three lectures, we've given you the tools necessary to go about taking derivatives, taking integrals, and so on. Now we're going to see the payoff, or a payoff, to a lot of that, which is the ability to actually maximize or minimize a function. Now we're going to start off from one dimension here. Later in part five of the class, we'll do multiple dimensions, deal with constraints on optimization. But for now, we're going to consider a one-dimensional, unconstrained problem, where you're just trying to find the maximum or minimum of a function. Okay. So let's start off by discussing what a maximum or minimum is. Now. These are very intuitive concepts, and it turns out they're defined very intuitively as well. The maximum of a function on any domain right, um, is just the point at which the function is highest. If your domain runs from here to here, a to b, then the maximum of this function can be found by just looking at the function, and it's this red dot right here is the maximum, and it occurs at this point down here. Similarly, the minimum of the function can be found by um, observation as well. In this case, it occurs at the bound down here, and at, this, at the point A. So we have a maximum and a minimum. We can find it just by looking at the function, or the graph of the function. That's true in general. If I do other functions, you could also find maximum minima here. This is an inverted parabola. It's a parabola, but facing down. Here's the maximum up there. I should change color. Here's the maximum up here. It occurs at this point here, the center of the parabola. And the minimum in this range, there are actually two minima. Each of the points here, assuming they're symmetric around the middle, is a minimum of the function. So in general, if you draw the picture, you can usually find the minimum and the maximum pretty quickly. Thing is, for most cases we deal with practically, you can't draw the picture. It's too messy, too hard to deal with, or you just have a general function. Um, it might be difficult to draw. And plus, drawing a picture and ob observing the, the points doesn't always get the answer easily. Um, for instance, if the point is not something, some nice round number, right? Maybe it's 5.7.1234 going on for 10 digits. You can't just draw a picture and point to it. You're not going to find the exact maximum. You just get close. So we need a better way to actually find the maximum minima than drawing a function and pointing at things. And that's sort of the goal of this lecture. So the maximum and the minimum of a function are extreme values of a function. And we're going to be trying to find extrema in one dimension. So 
before you do so, um, well, before you do so, there's a few things. But first, let's discuss different kinds of extrema. All the examples I've shown so far are what are called global extrema. A global extremum is either a global maximum or a global minimum. And global here means it's the largest value or the smallest value of the function on the entire domain. We will often find cause, though, to look for other kinds of maxima or minima, specifically local maxima or minima. So remember, global was the largest or the smallest value of the function on the entire domain. Local, in contrast, are largest or smallest value of the function in some restricted area. Now, why do we care about that? Let's see. Let's draw a similar one to the one we just drew before. Here's a kind of complicated function. It's got many ups and downs. Where's the max, where are the maxima? Well, over here, if this if the domain starts here and ends here, then the minimum is down here. And it's a global minimum at the smallest point in the entire function. And the global maximum is up here. It's the largest point on the entire function. But what about all these points in blue? They're not the biggest or the smallest points in the entire function, but they are the biggest and smallest points in their re local regions, right? This is the smallest point from here to here, and so on, right? Is that useful to us? Turns out it is useful to us because the technique we're going to use to find maxima will center on all local maxima. Why? Well, they have a very particular characteristic. Let's look for a moment at the function. The function is increasing up here, and increasing up here, and increasing up here. But it's decreasing down here, down here, and that's it. Right, and I'm, I'm calling it increasing and decreasing based on moving further down the number line. Well, what, what's, what, what do these points have in common, these local maxima? Well, they occur, they occur at the points of intersection between the blue and red lines, or rather where the function is increasing and decreasing. They occur at the point where the function stops increasing and starts decreasing, in the case of these maxima, right? So. It's increasing, increasing, increasing over here, and then suddenly starts decreasing. Same thing over here for these maxima, these local maxima. Whereas over here, they occur when the function is first decreasing and then starts increasing at both these local minima. Now, what does that mean? How does this relate to calculus at all? Right? Why did we go through all this calculus beforehand to do this? Well, what determines whether or not a function is increasing or decreasing? It's derivative. Its first derivative tells you if the function is increasing or decreasing. If the first derivative is positive, the function is increasing. If the first derivative is negative, the function is decreasing. If the first derivative is zero, the function is neither decreasing nor increasing at that point. Let's take a look again at this, at this figure, at this graph. Well, let's start at this point here or here, right? At first, the function is increasing, so the first derivative will be positive over here at the left. Then, over here, the first derivative is decreasing. So the function is decreasing, so the first derivative will be negative in that region. Now this is, the first derivative here is continuous, so if it starts off positive and ends up negative, at some point it has to pass through zero. That point is a point where the derivative is the first derivative is zero, which is the point at which the tangent to the curve has a zero slope. That point is exactly the point where the tangent line just touches the function at this local maximum. And that is how derivatives are connected to maxima, or well, one way. The first derivative goes to zero at a local interior maximum, a local maximum or minimum, because the first derivative is changing sign from positive to negative in the case of a maximum, or from negative to positive in the case of a minimum. It passes through zero somewhere in the middle, 
at that point where it changes sign from positive to negative or negative to positive, that is a local extremum. When it goes from positive to negative, it's a local maximum. When it goes from negative to positive, it's a local minimum. So that's the connection to calculus. And we'll go through much more of this and see how you can use it for you. This will become the first derivative test. There'll be a second derivative test. We'll, decide, we'll define second derivatives ahead of that test. Um, but there'll be a whole technique built upon the use of derivatives to help us compute the location of these local maxima. Okay. Um, but that'll come a little later in the lecture. Before I finish with this module, though, I want to talk about one more thing, one more pair of definitions. And these are the supremum and the infimum. In all these cases I've talked about, the function has had a maximum or a minimum. Right? I've drawn these pictures like this. So if I draw just a straight um, y equals x line, on some closed domain, 0 to 1, and I've been assuming implicitly that all my little ABs are some closed domain. What if, however, I consider the open domain 0 to 1? Recall that an open set is one that does not contain its endpoints. Well, we discussed um, way back in lecture 2 that this function does not achieve a maximum on the open set 0 to 1, or a minimum for that matter. Right? Um, why? Because you can always move closer to 1 on the function y equals x, or f of x equals x, without ever reaching 1. So there's always a bigger number you can find without ever finding the biggest number in on this domain. What do we do about that? Well, by any practical measure, you look at this function and think, oh, the maximum's at 1. The problem is 1 is not in the set, and the maximum and the minimum are defined as the biggest and smallest value of the function on that domain. If it's not in the domain, it's not the maximum or the minimum. However, we can use slightly expanded definitions, the supremum and the infimum, to refer to the maximum and the minimum respectively on a slightly expanded domain. The supremum here is the least upper bound of the function, of the, func of the range of the, fu of the function. In this case, in this example, the least upper bound is 1. That's the smallest number such that all other numbers in the set are smaller than it. In other words, it's the smallest number such that it's bigger than all other numbers in the set, in the range of f of x on this domain. The infimum is the greatest lower bound. It's the biggest number such that all other numbers in the domain, uh, in the range of the function on the domain, are larger than it. Again, it's the greatest lower bound, the infimum is. It's the biggest number such that all other numbers in the in the um, range of the function are bigger than it. Those two things are used rarely in political science applications, social science applications, but you will see them sometimes, and you will see them occasionally. Um, you will see them occasionally defined as sup or inf. They basically are just like max or min, but allow you some flexibility in defining these things on sets in which um, all the point, the points towards the maximum and minimum would occur are not actually in the domain, but are close to it. <laughs> okay. So that are the basics. Um, extremum, what they are, maximum and minimum, local and global, supremum and infimum. These are the core concepts we're going to use to go as we go on and try to understand more things. First, though, we're going to have to understand a little more about how functions are shaped. And to do that, we're going to have to introduce higher order derivatives, which we'll do in the next module. Thank you very much.